I originally promised myself that I wasn't going to talk too much about the pandemic, uh, but listening to Brian McNamara earlier on, I realized that some of the views that we have on its potential silver linings are close enough and yet different enough to be worth just underlining. So if you'll excuse me just a few minutes, I wanted to, in some senses, echo what, what Brian said earlier. It may seem in very poor taste to talk about silver linings when we're talking about a catastrophe that's been um, so vast and has affected so many people. And yet it really is important to see the good in it. It has helped, I think, in a critical way at a critical moment. And perhaps the most important sense of that is that it's helped us to realize everybody on the planet that we truly are all in one boat. And that sounds simple, but it's so very rare, vanishingly rare, perhaps unique in modern history for anything to have happened that has truly, truly proved to us day after day that we are all in that same boat. Ever since modern human beings walked out of the Great Rift Valley all those tens of thousands of years ago and stopped being a single tribe, inhabiting a single space and facing a single set of problems. You could argue that the story of human innovation since that point has been a story of us trying to get back together again, to get back to be a single tribe. And you could equally well argue that today in 2021, we've pretty much succeeded, at least potentially. The vast majority of us are able now to think of ourselves as a single united tribe facing a common set of problems. The difference this time is that the problems are all problems we've caused ourselves, but we'll let that lie. And so in a very important sense, the pandemic has reminded us of that progress, but also the return to the starting point. We're once again, all sitting around the same campfire and fearing the same darkness. It is, if you like, the zenith of globalization and that must make us think more about globalization, the good and the bad because globalization brings so much good and yet potentially brings so much harm. One of the things that always makes human beings feel more united is the presence of a common enemy. And I think we all know this, it's, it's well known. The leaders of nations over the last centuries have used this dynamic over and over again to create a sense of unity, to forge in the crucible of an external threat, some sense of common purpose. And what's really been lacking in the world up until recently has been the sense of a global common enemy. Climate change for various reasons doesn't quite fit the bill. Our imaginations find it difficult to perceive climate change as our common enemy because it seems too far away, it seems too vague, it seems too disparate as a threat, too somehow unreal, no matter how real it seems to get. Almost the only time that us human beings ever really get a sense of being part of the same tribe is when we leave the cinema in the afternoon after watching some terrible movie like Independence Day and we've seen the humans fight back against the aliens. And for a second there, just for a second, we all understand what it feels like to be rooting together against a common enemy. But outside the cinema, it almost never happens or it had almost never happened until the pandemic. And day after day after day, anybody who has access to any kind of media, any kind of communication channel has witnessed other people so much like them and yet so different from them, suffering in the same ways and yet in such different ways. And you can't come out of that experience unchanged. The feeling won't last forever. It's a little bit like I imagine the feeling is when you go into orbit and you see the planet uh, as, a, as a distant place. It doesn't last forever, but something of it remains within you. The second thing that the pandemic has shown us, and Brian also touched upon this, is that it's shown us a little humility. It's shown us above all that the human race has no special dispensation to survive. We can be carried off at any moment. It could be something as almost invisible as a virus. It could be almost anything. And we, teenagers as we are, think that we're immortal. We have a tendency to believe that whatever happens will survive and whatever problems occur will fix them. And what the pandemic has also done is it showed us, hold on, don't be too sure. And that's so very important a part of growing up. Complacency has all the biggest obstacles to greater human progress. Humanity has a notorious and tragic habit 
I'm never really changing its direction until the 11th hour and the 59th minute. And of course, the particular worry at the moment with climate change is that the 11th hour and the 59th minute is already too late. It is already too late because of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. But that doesn't mean we have to stop trying. The desire to reassert normality, to go back to the way we, we were before, is reasserting itself so quickly and so powerfully. We can see it all around us. And that's why we need to take advantage of this moment, this moment of weakness, to get the messages across that need to be got across. And I do believe it's very important that those messages should be positive. I'm like several of the other speakers today. I'm unfashionably optimistic. It seems to me that a lot of things are going in the right direction at last. And the COP, the COP26 in Glasgow, even though it was never going to produce the things that the more optimistic of us hoped it might produce, nonetheless, it does show us that things are changing. What I mean by being optimistic about it is perhaps what you might call taking the, the Winston Churchill approach rather than the Al Gore approach. No criticism of Al Gore, who's been absolutely instrumental in getting the message about climate change across to so many of us. But his manner has always admittedly, or rather in the past, tended to be the manner of an Old Testament prophet, thumping a great book and prophesying war and floods and famine if we don't repent of our evil ways. And that's fine up to a point, but continuing on this theme of us all being a little bit immature, we do, like children, have a bit of a tendency when we hear something that we don't like the sound of to put our fingers in our ears and say, nya, 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 I can't hear you. We do that. Winston Churchill, on the other hand, was rather clever. When he spoke to the British people at the dawn of the Second World War, yes, he did mention that tough times were ahead, days and weeks and possibly years of darkness, but mainly he reserved his rhetoric for describing what would come afterwards to use modern language to describe it, he branded a perfect future. And what he did was he drove people wild with the prospect of this perfect future that they could be part of if they were prepared to struggle and persist and to keep going. And I think that kind of attitude, that kind of message is what we need to hear. There is so much that's good to say about the future. There is so much about it that's enormously enticing and enormously exciting. If only we can hold on to those dreams and we need more people talking about them. Fundamentally, I think our problem, certainly my problem, and it may be the same for you, is that when I'm thinking about these gigantic challenges, and I don't just mean pandemics and climate change, I mean all of the sustainable development goals, all of the 20, 30, 40 systemic challenges that humanity is facing in the 21st century, I feel so powerless. The sentence that always seems to run through my mind is, little old me versus great big world, and how can I possibly have an impact? And we're never short of inspirational speakers telling us, yes, you may be just one person, your gestures may be small, but if we all do it together, then we'll make a big difference. The trouble is we know that we're not very good at all doing things together. And behind that statement is always this sensation that a lot of what we're doing at the personal level, at the individual level, at the family level, these are somehow empty gestures that we switch from plastic drinking straws to paper ones, that we recycle our garbage, there's this worry, isn't there, always lurking at the back of our mind that this is futile because the scale is just too small compared to the vastness of the problems we're facing. And you know, I'm gonna say something perhaps a little bit controversial here and suggest that actually maybe some of these gestures are futile and maybe we should accept that, but it doesn't devalue them. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing them because their primary value is communicative. And the reason why I say that is because it's in the nature of us, the human species, that we never change until and unless we're convinced that everybody is changing. And so when we see people changing around us, even if those tiny changes they're making don't make any difference on the planetary scale, what they do do is they exercise a persuasive function on others. And they give us that sense that if we go down to the waterhole and start to drink, we won't be the animal the only animal down there. We won't find ourselves alone because others are going to. And you could extrapolate from that perhaps the even more outrageous suggestion that maybe greenwashing isn't all that bad. I mean, of course, greenwashing is bad. Of course, you shouldn't claim that you're saving the planet when you're not. Of course, we should be very alert to it. And of course, we should criticize it loudly and frequently whenever we see it. 
But in the end, it may not be all that damaging because it has this communicative function. It helps to create an environment where we all begin to understand what the truths and the values are of the world that we're living in today. And I think even greenwashing, even greenwashing, though it should be stamped out, is playing a part in persuading us that there is a general sense of movement and that we should be part of it. All of these challenges that we're facing, I mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals and the United Nations has uh, very eloquently um, identified um, 17 of them. I've always felt that those 17 SDGs were actually 16 challenges, 16 doors and one key. And the one key is the 17th, the one that talks about cooperation and collaboration. To resolve those grand challenges, whether it's climate change or pandemics or anything else, it's not that we don't know the solutions. We do know the solutions. We know the solutions to all the problems facing us today. The problem is that we don't bring enough resource to bear against those gigantic globalized problems. We've been much more successful, you could say, in globalizing our problems than in globalizing our solutions. They're all fixable if only we bring enough collective resources to bear against them. And the reason that we don't do that, and it's very, very evident at the COP this week and last week, is that the culture of governance is wrong. Ever since the Treaty of Westphalia and long before, countries have configured themselves as individual competitive tribes, fighting against each other for advantage, for speed, for dominance. And I think it is absolutely essential and indispensable that we find a way of ushering in a new culture of governance between corporations and between other organizations. One that puts collaboration first and competition second. There's nothing wrong with competition. Of course, competition is essential for business. It's essential for progress. Competition has lifted billions of people out of poverty. It's an instinct of human nature. We couldn't get rid of it even if we wanted to. But competition only becomes a problem when it's the only altar at which we worship. And that has been the case now for far too long. The reality of the matter is that competition and collaboration can sit very well together. What industry back in the 70s used to call co-opetition, the mingling of collaboration and competition can be highly effective. And it's an experiment that's decades overdue for the governments of the world. And what I spend my life trying to do most of the time is to persuade governments to understand that actually the gold standard of good governance in the 21st century, and by the way, I think this applies to the governance of corporations just as much as it does to the governance of countries, the gold standard is harmonizing your domestic and your international responsibilities. I sometimes describe this as being what I call a dual mandate. The traditional mandate was that people who were in a position of power and authority were responsible for their own people and their own slice of territory, and that was it. And if in protecting their own people and their own territory, they harmed somebody else's people or somebody else's territory, that was fine, it just showed how tough they were. I think now we are absolutely certainly living in an age where we have to have a dual mandate for all of our holders of power and authority. Yes, you are responsible for your own people, but also to some extent for every man, woman, child and animal on the planet, whether you like it or not. Yes, you are responsible for your own slice of territory, of course, but also you are responsible for every inch of the Earth's surface, the atmosphere above it and the ground beneath your feet, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you shouldn't be in a position of power or responsibility because those are the new rules of the game. What can we do to change? Well, I'm feeling pretty good about the COP, partly because it wasn't uh, a huge success. And I think we needed that. I think it's another dose of reality. We've given the politicians 26 chances uh, to fix the world. And it seems pretty clear that 26 wasn't enough and time has now run out. Maybe this is the moment when we all do finally understand that this is far too important to be left to the politicians. It's far too important to be left to the corporations. It's far too important to be left to civil society. Nothing less than a functioning collaboration of all three will take us away from the problems that we're facing. To put it another way, now is the time we need to grow up and we need to abandon that childish illusion that the grown-ups, the adults, the politicians are gonna sort it all out for us. The writing's on the wall. We're the adults now and it's time for us to grow up. Thank you.